And let's jump into the Word of God. Anybody excited about the Word? Amen. Let's jump into the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Starting at verse 11. Starting at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Amen. Before we end service today, we're going to pray for all our teachers. They are battling anxiety and borderline depression. <laughs> they, look, they're waving their hands now like, where did the summer go? <laughs> yep, school starts this week. Amen. And we're just going to pray a special anointing for you uh, before you leave. We're also going to pray over our children at the conclusion of our service today. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. New Living Translation says this. It says, there is much more we would like to say about this. But it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull. It's going to be a tough one today. And don't seem to listen. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies. See, we don't like text like this. We want to. It's September. We're like, Lord, give me the promise text and the faith text. And the, you are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know what to do is right. Solid food is for the mature who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Let us pray. Lord, I pray now that they not hear my voice or see my face, but only hear and see the voice and face of you that lives in me. God, I pray now clarity, conviction where needed, and courage where needed. Help us all to be better because of this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said together, amen. Amen. I want to preach today from this simple thought, from well, the moments I have to share with you. Come out, come out wherever you are. You just tell your neighbor, this is the last time I'm going to tell you to talk to your neighbor all day. Just let them know. Say, come out, come out. Wherever you are. I believe that if we all would agree, we are living in a time where cultural immaturity is at an all-time high. I believe that if we be honest, as we begin to think about social media beefs, if we begin to think about subtweeting, if we begin to think about the context of emotions that are overly sensitive, I know nobody's going to say amen on this sermon today. It's cool. I prepared myself to be up here by myself. Uh, I believe that when we start to think about how many times we get our heart broken over people that we should have never invested our heart in, I believe that when we start to think about, oh, nobody's going to say amen today. It's cool. I believe that when we start to think about the generation that is consistently knows each other by handles and hashtags but not by full names uh we y'all it's amazing to me the cultural immaturity i believe that we are living in a time where we have bought into some lies more than ever before and one of the greatest lies is that some of us think we're grown that ain't really grown only parents clap right there it was like, see, I knew they was going to do this today. It, it is amazing to me when we start to think about the context of what it means to mature and matriculate through life. Uh, I start to ask myself, are we as mature as we think we are? Can I just make a couple public service announcements? If you still uh, need to go to your parents' house and get them to help you pay bills, you are not as grown as you think you are. I have security to help me out here today. If 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 you still if you still if you still uh, uh, can't enjoy or you cannot endure somebody telling you the truth, and you would prefer people tell you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear, you may not be as calm as you think you are. And I'm not going to stay on that long because I know a lot of y'all don't want me to run down the whole list of things that might identify or expose our cultural immaturity. Uh, uh, if, if you're dating somebody and you don't know their real last name. You may. 
may not be as wrong as you think you are. And I just, today, I want to call out all the people uh, who are ready to move from cultural immaturity to real maturity. But, but beyond that, I think one of the greatest tragedies is not just cultural immaturity, but spiritual immaturity. I believe that one of the greatest tragedies of the Christian church today is that we have created a generation and a culture of Christians who are babies. So if you're looking for the feel-good sermons, this particular series, I might encourage you to take a month off because this is the month where we grow up. This, this, this is the month where I would like to stretch you and challenge you to reconsider the maturity of your faith. We just came out of a series called DNA where we unpack the core values, the mission of our church and our identity and who we're trying to be. And I encourage you to check that series out if you want to know more about who we are and the scriptures that we're foundationally built on. But I believe in this next sermon series, we're going to be stretched and challenged. And this is a in your face sermon series. It is not the one that you might want to tell your friends about. You might not share this sermon series, but I promise you, if you lean into it, you will become a better and a more mature to a Christian, which is why we have named this sermon series Grownish. Because it is time for us to truly grow up. It, it, Francis Chan, one of my favorite theologians and communicators of this day and time, says something that I think is not directly uh, implicated with maturity, but I believe it applies to our conversation today. He says this, our greatest fear should not be a failure but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. I would like for us to consider today that could it be that there are some things that we have accomplished that don't matter to God as much as they matter to us. I would like to suggest today that could it be that there are some areas of our life that our friends celebrate but that God is not equally as excited about success in our job because success in our job has meant immaturity in our faith. Could I suggest to you today that there are some seasons of our life where we have misappropriated what God celebrates? That we thought God celebrated us singing on Sunday when God said, you've been singing in the choir since you were a kid. And singing does not represent your maturation, but preaching may in this next season. That could it be that your tithing in the last season was how God measured your maturation. But in this season, God will measure your maturation by your evangelism. That you're comfortable giving because that puts you behind the spotlight, but you're not comfortable sharing. That if we are to grow in our faith, here's the reality. That in every season, God will stretch you somewhere. That you should never be, I'm most worried about Christians who are comfortable. Because the closer we get to God, the more challenging Christianity becomes. That the truth of the matter is, it's the simple things of Christianity that are difficult. You know, we love texts like, you know, turn the other cheek. And then all of us be like, I ain't turning the other cheek. The reality of it is, Scripture and Christianity is a journey of maturation, not a journey of comfort. And that if we are to honor God with our lives, we have to think back on what area of my life is God trying to grow me up. This is why I love the writer of Hebrews and what he says about this particular context of Christians he's writing to. In the book of Hebrews, he says to them, he says, hey, I love y'all. Y'all are church I planted. I'm excited to be in relationship with you. But if we're going to be real friends, I got to be honest with you. I'm a little disappointed. Because you ought to be further along by now. You know, you ought to be moving at a different pace by now. You ought to be clearer about your spiritual identity by now. You ought to be someone who is operating in a higher level of anointing by now. You ought to be somebody who can discern my voice and your friend's voice by now. You ought to be somebody who knows what relationships are good for you and what relationships are bad for you by now. You ought to be further along. 
And so he says to them, some of you are like babies on milk and not on solid food. And, and can I just make this one last bold statement while y'all are already offended? Could I suggest to you that Christianity is one of the only spaces of our life where we will allow people to remain infants indefinitely? Can I just talk right here for a little bit? I want you to hear my heart this fall. My heart is this. I want us to grow as a church, but not at the expense of you growing. And so my heart for this series is that you would be stretched and challenged to ask yourself some questions about your spiritual maturity. That you would be stretched to ask yourself and to consider about your life. Is it possible that I am not growing at the rate and at the pace that God desires for my life? Could it be that I have remained an infant? And I can still quote the same scriptures I learned in Sunday school back when I was a child. But I have not expanded my knowledge of biblical narrative. And could it be that I've been giving the same amount? but I've received three promotions since then. I'm not going to say nothing. That could it be that, 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 that I have continuously showed up to church service, but I have not shown up to a fifth Sunday service, and that I need to be stretched in my walk. Throughout this series, I have four objectives that I want you to see because I want you to be abundantly clear about the direction that we're headed in as a community. Four objectives throughout these next six or seven weeks. The first is that you understand some spiritual pathways. Many people don't talk about spiritual pathways, but spiritual pathways are how you find intimacy with God because every single person in this room is different. And sometimes the greatest frustration of your faith is that you keep trying to find God the way your neighbor did. And you're frustrated because you keep praying the way they prayed and you can't seem to hear God the way you need to hear God because it could be that you have not tapped into your spiritual pathway. And I promise you, if you show up next week for that conversation, some of you will be liberated to recognize that you've been closer to God more than you thought you have. You just haven't encountered his presence here. You encountered it somewhere else. That messes with some people's theology. Because they thought the only place they would feel the presence of God was at church. For some of you, once you find your spiritual pathway, you'll find out that you found the presence of God somewhere else. That when we walk through the different nine spiritual pathways, you'll find out that while you experience God in worship here, you may also experience God on your way to work. And for some of you, you may find that while you experience God in worship here, you also experience God in other settings that are non-traditional, but that's when you feel closest to God. And so I want to liberate some of you to find out how to build intimacy with God. You'll also find out your spiritual gifts because some of us need to understand that there's too much in us for us to keep sitting down and being consumers and not contributors to the movement of the kingdom. Then some of us will... Be more self-aware. Does anybody have somebody in their life who is just not self-aware? I mean, like, they just talk to you at times, and you just be like, you are clueless to who you are. <laughs> and self-awareness is the first step to maturity. That if we are to grow in our spiritual maturity, we must have increased self-awareness. So we're going to look at our temptations. We're going to look at our strengths. And I love this part. I call it sweet spots. Where is God using me most? Where is God using me best? Where is God calling me to be so that I can be in the sweet spot of my spiritual journey? The last thing we'll kind of walk through, we'll talk about the development of disciplines because you can get information, but if you don't have the disciplines to sustain them, we'll walk through this series next year and be right back where we started. And so I want for the next few moments of this sermon to kind of lay the foundation for what we'll be talking about over the next several weeks. And, and, and I want to make sure that you understand that if you are to create what I believe is your spiritual profile, and you need to understand that we need to make some clear goals. And here's how we start. I want to go to Psalms 139. I believe this particular passage gives us the framework and the foundation for maturation. Gives us the framework and the foundation for maturation. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Psalm 39, verse 23 through 24. Y'all ready? Say, I'm ready. ready. Here it is. It says this. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me 
and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Here it is. I want to give you four things that I believe are the foundation to you growing in your spiritual maturity today. We're going to talk about prayer life. We're going to talk about stewardship. We're going to be talking about temptations and how to manage them. We're going to be talking about your spiritual pathway, how to hear God's voice more clearly because some of us have been struggling to hear God's voice. We're going to talk about how to create disciplines that help you to be more sensitive to the voice of God. We're going to talk about all that, but it means nothing if we don't lay some foundation. Amen? Amen? So let's lay some foundation today so that everything else can be built on top of that. Here's number one. The first thing you need to understand that this passage helps us to understand about the foundation of spiritual maturation is that we need to start asking, Lord, search me. Lord, search me. Because we need to understand that without invitation, we are left to our own self-awareness to assess our spiritual maturation. So what happens is many of us celebrate ourselves for accomplishments. But God says, in this season, I want you to invite me to search you and help you assess where you really are. Search me so that I can see what you see, Lord. Search me and notice what the Lord is searching. It doesn't say, Lord, Search my mind, Lord. Look at what it says. It says, search my what? Heart. Because here it is. From the mouth, you find inspiration. From the mind, you find ideas. Watch this. But from the heart, you find intent. And for so many of us, we good at what we say. We inspire people. You know, the Lord is good all the time and all the time. The Lord is good. Ain't he faithful all the time? God, the Lord is faithful. And we quote scriptures. And we think the Lord is impressed by our dialect. But the Bible even tells us, he tells us, he says, Matthew 15, 33, he says, For these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So we have to be careful not to affirm the maturation of our spirituality by just how good we can speak. Because with our mouth, we can inspire people. With our mind, we got great ideas. It's, it, it, oh, yeah, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. But it is with our heart that God assesses intent. That's why the Bible also tells us in Proverbs, he says, For as a man thinketh in his, so is he or she. So it is important to contextualize that when you ask God to search you, please understand he's not searching your ideas. And he's not searching your scriptures uh, database. He is searching the intent of your heart. Because some of us show up every Sunday and our intent verbally sounds good. But when the Lord evaluates our heart, we didn't come for him. We came for a boo. Y'all not going to say amen. We didn't come for God. We came for accolade. We didn't come for God. We came for a solo. But when you make up in your mind, Lord, search my heart, you may be surprised at what he says back. Search my heart. The question I want you to ask when you go home tonight, because I believe discipleship is not just what you hear on Sunday. It's the devotion that you do when you go home on Monday. I believe you need to ask yourself, what is the condition of my heart? What is the condition of my heart? For some of you, you have lied to yourself so long that it's going to take you time to see the, content, the, the condition of your heart. As we begin to think about this, he says, I am searching your heart. But here's the second thing I think it is. Watch this. Not only should we say, search me, we should also say, Lord, stretch me. Look at the second verse, second part, second line. He says, search me a lot. Know my my heart. Test me. This is going to be the tough part. I don't know about anybody in this room, but um, uh, I was an average student in academia. I'm I, I just going to testify for myself. Uh, I'm not encouraging that. I'm just letting you know. Uh, I'm not proud of my academic life. I don't preach about it often for a reason. It ain't much to say. And, uh, and the truth of the matter is, while I wasn't a horrible student, I was a lazy student. I was very lazy in the effort that I put towards study. I was very lazy in the effort that I put towards test. And there was nothing more troubling to me than finding out a 
test was on the horizon. Because here's what's interesting about tests. I don't care who you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how what, what you've done and your GPA. Tests will stress you out. Let me tell you something. A test will just stress you out. And I was just a person. I would go in to take tests. And I, that's when I knew I loved God the most. Because I would pray before tests. Some of y'all know your greatest prayer life manifested at test time. You were walking there and started speaking in tongues. You ain't spoken tongues, no service. You ain't spoken tongues. You just shout by by cool. Lord, if I ever need to be Holy Spirit, be a guider through the scantron. Won't he do it? How about sure cool? Guide my pencil, Lord God. Test ain't 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 not trying to do no test. It tests. Even in your job now. Somebody say, oh, we gotta take a test. You better gotta take a test. I, think I got experience. I don't want to take no tests. I've been doing this job 15 years. And it's amazing. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Because I'm amazed at how many people in spirituality, watch this, don't miss this, don't miss this. I'm amazed at how many people in spirituality. <laughs> this is going to be tough, Brittany. Allie, ain't nobody going to like me when I say this. Okay, just, just got to prepare myself. I'm going to look down at my notes because I want to make eye contact with y'all. It amazes me how many people ask God to trust us before he tests us. It's amazing to me how many of us say, God, you can trust me with more. But we reject the test with what we have in the present. It's amazing how many of us fail tests and still ask God for a graduation. That we fail test of attitude. But then say, God, give me more people to lead. That we fail test of discipline. But they said, God, give me more opportunity. That we fail test of stewardship. But they say, God, bless me with more money. That we fail test or we reject test. And then say, but God, I'm ready for more. And we'll shout and fall out in church. As if God is impressed with our singing and not our lifestyle and how we manage the... Y'all are not going to say amen today. And if you are going to mature in your faith in this season, you not only need to say, search me, you need to say, Lord, stretch me. Lord, I am willing to be tested. I am willing to be stretched. Notice the words of the writer of Psalms. He, he invites the Lord. To give him a test. Lord, I will prove to you that I'm ready for the next season. I'm, who prove to you I'm ready for the next dimension. I'll prove to you I'm ready for more glory. I'll prove to you I'm ready for more anointing. And I don't prove it by how I preach. I prove it by my integrity. I prove it by my character. I prove it by my faithfulness. I prove it by my stewardship. I prove it by my kindness. I prove it by my patience. I prove it by some fruits of the Spirit. So stop judging people by something other than their fruit. important to understand that we need to be tested. Martin Luther King says it like this. He said, the ultimate measure of a man or woman is not measured in moments of comfort and convenience, but in moments of challenge and controversy. Why? Because the greatest measurement of who you are is not when things are ideal. The greatest measurement is in the mess. Sometimes when your life is messiest is when God is able to take a true accurate assessment of where you really are in your maturity. Because many of us, if we be honest in this room, when life is peachy, everything is great with our attitude and our spirit and our faith and our joy and our mouth and our mind. But it is only when tested. That's why the writer writes this. Can I go to the word? Test my what? Anxious thoughts. Because there's something to your thoughts when they are anxious, that is different than when they're at calm. And you need to make up in your mind, Lord, I'm ready for the test of the next season. Test me so I can show you that I've matured with my mouth. Test me so I can show you I've, I've matured in my stewardship. Test me so I can show you I've matured in my integrity. Because I'm not ready for marriage because of what nobody knows, because God knows. And we keep saying, God, bless me with someone. And he's saying, but your DMs don't say you ready. Can you just high five your neighbor and say, test me? 
Oh, I won't say that. Some of y'all going to be mad when y'all go home. I'm going to lose 12 members today. Lord, test me. Here's the question you need to ask when you go home, when you think about being stretched. Here's the question, if you can put that on the screen. The question that you need to ask yourself is, where in my life can I be open for divine challenge? Because we love to invite God into our lives to bless us. But the writer encourages us to invite God also into our life to test us. Go on. Scripture also tells us not only search me, O Lord, test me and know my anxious thoughts. But then he goes on to say, point out anything in me that offends you. Because if we are to truly grow up, every now and then you need to invite God to show up and tell you the truth about who you really are. Not the version of you that you show people. Not the version of you that you post. This is why I believe so many marriages have been under attack. Because we love to present to people a polished presentation when all hell is breaking loose at home. And then when opportunity presents itself for us to get the help that we need, we, we walk into, all right, now look, we good when we walk in here, right? Hey, man, oh, man, no, hey, love me, hey, man, married, ain't it crazy, man? Yeah, man, we just figuring it out. You know how it is. No, no, no. We confused. We stressed. We don't like each other. Not today, not yesterday. Matter of fact, been a couple months. We need help. And this is what the enemy does. The enemy has created a cultural presentation of us. And we, so we say, okay, and, 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 and what happens is over time, you become content with the presentation of your life that is not an accurate reflection of who you really are. And so the writer says, if you really want to mature, if you really want to grow in God, I, I want you to do all the other stuff. I want you to show up to church. I want you to get your promises. I want you to get your prosperity. I want you to get all of that. But in the meantime, uh, I also want you to ask God to point out anything in me that offends you. So if I'm not treating my spouse right, point it out. If I'm not, if I'm not displaying the work ethic that is reflective of a Christian on my job, point it out. If I'm not being the friend that you called me to be, point it out. If I'm not being the, the, the giver that you want me to be, point it out. If I'm being selfish with my time, with my resources, or with my talents, point it out. If I am being someone who is not reflecting the kindness and the patience that you would call me to as a fruit of the Spirit, point it out. And if we are going to mature, we can't just keep coming to God saying, God, I'm ready for what you have to give to me. God said, now, this is the season where you say, now, let me talk to you about you. Show me me. Here's a question that we have to answer in this particular segment. I want you to wrestle with it on your own time. I want you to devote your time to it. What needs to grow up in my life to better reflect my relationship with God? I promise you, if you ask that question for real, and you don't come up with an answer, I'm questioning who you've been talking to. Because I have never asked God, preacher or not, seminary degree, all that's wonderful. A master's in divinity, I can impress you with some words, hermeneutically and homiletically and all that, ecclesiastic, all that beautiful stuff. And at the end of it all, Aaron, every time I sit with God, he shows me something about myself that I don't like. Sometimes he shows me pride. Sometimes he shows me that I'm overly ambitious. Sometimes he shows me that I'm not being as kind as I need to be to my children. Sometimes he shows me that I'm being selfish in the way I'm treating a friend. Sometimes he shows me that I'm being stingy. And if we want to honor God and mature in our spirituality, we need to also say, show me. Me. I love what Craig Rochelle says this. This is where it gets tough. He says, but people don't hate change. They just hate when you try to change them. Can I suggest to you this is the greatest difficulty of Christianity. And we come to church for our lives to be changed. Talk to y'all. We love coming to church saying, Lord, change my life. We just don't want God to change us. So we will show up and say, Lord, today is the day for a miracle. 
in that song. Go. Today is your day. Y'all know the song. And we shout and sing over miracles. And we celebrate favor. And we believe in promise. And we believe in God's faithfulness. But may I suggest to you that God doesn't just want you to come so that you can be a consumer of what he can do for your life. But he also wants you to be willing to say there's some things I want to change about your life. That there are some areas of your life that are not conducive to the fruitfulness that I am trying to produce. That there's some areas of your attitude that you don't want me to touch. There's some areas of your, okay, watch this. That there's some areas of your relationships that you don't want me to touch. That there's some areas of your money. That you don't want me to touch. That there's some preferences and some perspectives that you have made up in your mind. God, you can do everything else in my life, but don't touch that. And I believe that you would rob yourself of the fullness of spiritual maturation. So I can't answer this question for you. This sermon is not me telling you what it is. But I would challenge you to ask yourself, what needs to grow up in my life to better reflect my relationship with God? Here's the last thing I believe that God shows us in the passage. He says, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. He also goes on to say, he says, you know, he says, hey, point out anything in me that offends you. So I want to know if there's something about me that is not in alignment with you. But then he also says this. He says, and lead me. Because after we've been shown who we really are, we should also be willing to follow the spirit of God and be sent. That God never designs your spiritual journey for you to stay put. That there's always ascending. Even if you're in a season of waiting, it is because God is going to be sending you. He says, lead me. And this is where we got to go to Romans. I want to go to Romans 8 really quick. I didn't give you all this, but let's go to Romans 8, 26 through 27. Same translation. I want to read you this last passage of Scripture. The band can come on back up here as I begin to close. But I want you to see something that I believe is critical to your ability to be sent. Romans 8, verse 26 says this. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. I know you don't like this sermon because this sermon means you got to do something with your life. It means you got to spend some time with God that you don't have. Because here's what you're saying in your head right now. Can I be honest? Here's what many of you are saying. I'm, you know, school starts this week. And it's about to get busy. And I did I buy all the, the stuff that I get the crayons. To get, did I set up my room right? I might have some bad kids this year. I don't know what I'm going to have. It's going to be a stressful year. It's just a lot happening. It's about to be busy season at my job. And you are already coming up in your mind. Here's what the enemy does. You are already beginning to articulate in your mind all the reasons why you don't have the time to wrestle with these four questions. I don't got the time for all that, Vernon. I got kids going back to school. I don't got the time for all that. I got work to do. I don't, I don't have the time for that. And may I suggest, that if you don't have the time for God, this may be a season where he doesn't always have time for you. See, we don't preach like this anymore because we have created a gospel that is always for us. But I would like to suggest to you that the gospel also challenges us. And it is not just about courage to walk in faith, but it is also about conviction to live out your faith. Look at what the passage says. It says, lead me along the path of righteousness. Go back to the Hebrews passage. He said, those who mature know right from wrong. And so when we know this, we need to be willing to accept the reality that the Holy Spirit is a helper in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray about sometimes. Some of us, if we be honest, we're going to leave this room and say, I don't know what God is doing in my life. That, that, that was tough for me to hear today. But I need you to understand the Holy Spirit will pray with you. That the Holy Spirit will be a helper to you. Go to verse 27. For the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. The Spirit pleads for us in harmony with God's will. 
want you to hear this today as I prepare to close. It is possible for you to live a very Christian life, but not one where your will is in line with God's will. I know a lot of Christians who do their best, but fall short sometimes of fulfilling God's will because they were not self-aware enough to see that every decision they made was made out of flesh. And every relationship they got into, they got into out of flesh. And every vocational decision they made, they made out of flesh. And the way they spent their money, they spent it out of flesh. And the way they treated people, they did it out of flesh. And the way that they dealt with conflict, they did it out of flesh. And the way that they showed up to their job, they worked out of flesh. And if you ever really understand how to mature in God, every environment you're in and every conversation you have and everything you do, you would say, Lord, get the glory out of this. Can we be honest? There are some times, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. There are times when I'm leading this church and I walk into meetings and I just, God, I don't know what we're going to do next. To Holy Spirit be a helper. Pray with me so that I can be in harmony with God's will. I believe that the Lord of God, Lord God, wants to send you somewhere in this season. I believe with all my heart that he's trying to lead you along a path. For some of you, it'll be a new path. For some of you, it'll be further around the same path. I believe he's leading you down a path. Here's what I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to miss as God leads you into next that you cannot go into next the same way you are in now. You cannot walk into next with the same attitude of now. You cannot walk into next with the same selfishness of now. You cannot walk into next with the same issues. You got to make up in your mind at some point, Lord, I want you to search me. And then I'm comfortable with you testing me in this season. Know my thoughts. And then, Lord, I'm even comfortable with you coming back with an assessment and pointing out in me anything that offends you. Because what good is it for me to have a life that everybody else can celebrate, but a life that offends you? What good is it to have a life full of accomplishments that still offends you? What good is it to have a great social media presence if my life off of social media offends you? What good is it to have followers on my social media page if my page offends you? What good is it to have everything that people think I need and my life still offend you? I want you to do me a favor. I want you to ask this last question to yourself this week. Where is God leading me next? Where is God leading me next? Because God is sending you somewhere. Wherever he's sending you next, you got to deal with some stuff now. So as we walk through this series, we're going to talk about maturation. Some of you will start to see as God points out some things in you. You'll start to say, man, I'm still dealing with some temptations and some struggles that I thought I was over. Some of you, what you're going to see and God is going to show you and God is going to test you on your stewardship. You can be like, I've blessed you time and time and time again and you still won't tithe. So the question is, do you trust me or no? For some of us, we're going to be stretched in this season and tested with our patience because folk will test your nerve this school year, won't they? Come on here, I'm praying for all my teachers. You said, I'm just, and watch this. You're going to be saying, Lord, I just test me. And he said, I'm going to test you through the way you treat those kids who are most difficult. That they are going to see Christ through the way you're patient with them. That they're going to end this school year and say, you changed my life because when everybody else gave up on me and when everybody else said I was a troubled child and when everybody else kicked me out, you stuck with me because you remember that God stuck with you and that you weren't perfect and that you were a mess. And in fact, that God stuck with you, you're going to stick with me. This is where we are. I dare you. I dare you to make the fall 
not about just what you can get from God, but what God is trying to do in you and through you. Do me a favor. Would you close your eyes all across this room? I know that whenever sermons like these are preached, it leaves us in an interesting space. There are many ways to preach sermons. There are some times when we preach and we are preaching for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration. There are other times that I know God is calling us to preach a sermon that is prophetic. It's about what is on the horizon. It's about the things that you don't see yet exceedingly and abundantly. I know that God does those too. But let us not forsake. that We should never forget that conviction should be a part of our preaching as well. And if we ain't right, we need God to show us we ain't right. So I want to invite you for the next 90 seconds. For some of you, it may be the quietest and the slowest moment of your week. To just begin the journey of asking God, is there anything in me that offends you? Search my heart, God. Is my intent wrong? Do I have some intentions that are not aligned with you? God, I'm inviting you to test me this week and this month and this season. God, I'm inviting you to send me and lead me. Let's take a few moments. A few moments. God, your people are listening today. We're pursuing your voice. Because our Christianity is not just measured by how many services we come to. But it is measured by how willing we are to allow your spirit to be in control of our lives. So God, we pause for a few moments to let you know that we're here not just for ourselves, but for you. That we will wrestle all this week with that idea. People don't hate change. They hate when you try to change them. But God, we will say we are the ones who are open to you changing whatever it is that you want to change in our lives so that we can better reflect our relationship with you. Search us, oh God. Test us. Point out anything in us that offends you and lead us along the path of righteousness. God, with eyes closed and hearts open, there may be one today saying their first step today until the next is accepting you as their Lord and Savior. That they've been in a season of their life where they came to church today, maybe not knowing if they knew God or they believed in God, or maybe they just said, hey, I've heard that story before, but I've never felt it in this way. And today they want to make a decision to leave here different than they came and they want to accept you as their Savior. Somebody's heart being prompted today to make a spiritual decision I want you to know something God doesn't care about what you did last year last month last week last night but right now he said I care for you and I gave my only begotten son so that you could have life and life more abundantly and so that sacrifice covers your sin and your struggle and doesn't matter how far you've been and how deep you fail he will come and reach and grab you so if you're in this room today feeling like you're disqualified from the grace of God I want you to know that is not true God loves you. So with eyes closed and hearts open, if you're saying today, I want to give my life to Christ, or maybe you're saying I want to rededicate my life to Christ, I'm making a decision that I want to give my life back to Christ. If I'm being honest, I have misprioritized God's place and presence in my life. I put 
people. I put things above them. But today I am making a decision to put God back where he belongs. If that's you in this room today, you want to give your life to Christ. You want to rededicate your life to Christ. Nobody's looking at you. Nobody